Hello, my name is Mage, and welcome to Black and White Thinking, and to a new series where I am going to discuss bisexual tropes in mainly American mainstream film and television. So what's a trope? A trope being a shorthand tool within storytelling where a writer recreates plot devices, characters, etc. that the audience can already recognise because they have seen it before in previous stories. A cycle of images that repeats throughout literature and media and all storytelling mediums. In terms of bisexual television tropes, in the manner we will be discussing today, I essentially mean a group of attributes recognisable in a range of bisexual characters, or bicoded characters, that unify them as a collective. So instead of bisexual characters existing under one recognisable set of ideals, under one trope, I believe we can further categorise the portrayal of bisexual characters in the media in order to acknowledge the many, often problematic, bisexual tropes that are used within today's on-screen stories. The tropes I will discuss in this series are all ones that I have personally recognised myself, with the help of some people in my life, of course. Whilst I personally think all of the tropes I will discuss are prevalent in the media at the moment, if you don't, that's fine too. If you think I've missed anything or want to discuss this kind of sad bisexual media and analysis with me further, please come find me. My purpose here with identifying these tropes is to help people further understand how bisexual plus representation influences the views, norms and behaviours that society enacts and maintains around bisexuality, and how this affects the real-life treatment of bisexual people. This isn't a new idea, of course. The idea that storytelling affects ideas is archaic, and it remains obvious to us in all forms of human interaction. It has also been proven true through research. People are influenced by what they hear, see and absorb, and this can be particularly important when trying to understand the cultural treatment of minority groups. I'm bisexual, I think there is a place for this discussion, so here we are. For clarification, the definition of bisexual or bisexual plus I will be using is an umbrella identity, and I will be including those who also identify as queer, but not gay or lesbian, and those that identify as pansexual and other mogai labels within this definition. These labels are considered part of the bisexual community, and so when I say bisexual plus is not necessarily a character's personal identity label, but the label that encompasses all of these personal identity labels beneath one unifying word. If you want to find out more about the bisexual plus umbrella, please check out the link below to the bisexual resource centre. So what trope are we talking about today? The classic crazy bisexual chick, or the hypermanic pixie bisexual. Okay, so after finishing the outline for these tropes, and serious contemplation, I thought starting the series with a classic but still prevalent bisexual trope would be the way to go. So let's talk about the classic crazy bisexual girl, and take a look at how one trope consistently outshines others in its ability to adapt and evolve to the narratives and cultures it finds itself used in, in its ability to still exist without abandon after all of these years. Now the crazy classic bisexual chick is a complicated trope. A lot of bisexual plus characters in media are kind of portrayed as crazy. I am referring to something a little more specific here. The classic crazy bisexual chick is usually a woman and can often trace her route to the old, murderous and sexy Basic Instinct bisexual. Basic Instinct, a 1992 made by men thriller that starred Sharon Stone as a murderous bisexual woman who uses her sexuality and body to manipulate and seduce and sometimes literally murder those around her. She is the ultimate bad girl bisexual and she is ultimately one of the places a lot of this representation can be unintentionally sourced to in modern media. She is considered in some ways the peak framework for this manipulative, over-sexualized and insane bisexual lady. Or at least she is most famously acknowledged as such, being that Basic Instinct was a box office blockbuster. Side note, Basic Instinct is also a film that whilst looking into, I found that like 10 other actresses had rejected because they all thought the script was bad, until they found a practically unknown stone to fill the role, only for the director to film her vagina and put it in the film for the world to see without her knowledge. I was sitting on a sound stage, and my director said, can you hand me your underpants because we're seeing them in the scene and you shouldn't have underpants on, but we won't see anything. And I said, sure. I didn't know that this moment would change my life. So what I'd like you all to do is put your feet flat on the floor like mine, all of you. And I want you to join me in a moment that changed my life. <laughs> Ready? Set, go. Do you feel empowered? Maybe not. Let's do it again. I stand here as woman of the year, not as an individual, 
but to be with women and of women and to be here in my grace and in my tenderness and in my dignity. And I want to tell you, it was hard won after I only did that. So I want to say thank you for choosing me to be Woman of the Year, because there was a time when all I was was a joke. I feel like that sets the vibe well for this video. Also, one of the actresses who rejected it was created her own feminist film institute actor, Gina Davis. I literally would pay an endless amount of money to be a fly on Gina Davis's wall when she first read that script, honestly. Like, Thelma and Louise came out the year before, and whilst that is a far from perfect film, it is definitely the more nuanced take on bisexuality and women with mental health issues. Anyway, as I said, the classic crazy bisexual trope has been around for a long time, predating even Basic Instinct by hundreds of years, shout out to Carmilla, even if Sharon Stone represents its current Inception's historical starting point quite well to people. Alfred Hitchcock was also a pretty big fan of the use of bisexuality as a lustful denigration of one's mind, and if you've seen Rebecca or Rope or North by Northwest or literally any of his films, you'll know what I'm talking about. It is a complicated trope that transcends mediums and streams of different characters. However, mostly they are women in their 20s and 30s, mostly white, often blonde, and their bisexuality is always inherently tied to their perceived insanity, allowing these characters to become promiscuous wild cards at the disposal of any given writer. The succubus bisexual, not that one, who lures you in with her instability, with the need to take care of her, only to entrap you like a spider in her web of madness. This trope is the meeting point, in my opinion, between the depraved bisexual vamp and the manic pixie dream girl. The talented Mr. Ripley, but like, super misogynistic. The trope that Jennifer's body tried to teach everyone about, only to be slandered for years as a girl trash film. And for a trope that seemed to peak somewhere in the 80s and 90s, the portrayal of the classic crazy bisexual chick is still remarkably present in today's media, even if some writers have gotten better at hiding it, or they have even adapted long-used classic crazy bisexual female characters to meet a more modern perspective while still using the tropes entirely. There have been, let's say, some minor feminist awakenings around the application of this specific trope, but it's definitely still around. So let's have a look at what some of these representations of the classic crazy bisexual chick have looked like over the past 30 years, and let's see how this trope is still utilised and presented to a modern audience. Let's just look at some of the shows and films that I think are the biggest culprits when it comes to utilising this trope. 90s movies about bad bitches. Now in regards to personal exposure to this trope as a young bisexual woman, I think I found its presence most obvious in 90s movies, often starring people like Drew Barrymore or Angelina Jolie, real life bisexual actors. 90s movies, especially those that were considered kind of gritty girl flicks, aka films about wild women usually made by men, utilised the connection of madness, bisexuality and womanhood in a messy and somewhat cruel way sometimes. And here's the thing, whilst writing a specific look at this trope, I've had a hard time separating my love for the character's connected to it, the films that they exist in, from how that has influenced my own understanding of bisexuality over the years. A lot of these films, the ones I'm going to flash up on the screen or specifically talk about, are the films of my childhood, the kind of films I found comfort in as a disillusioned bisexual youth in a pre-adult Evan Rachel Wood era. These portrayals of feminine bisexuality and mental health issues paired together to create a promiscuous mad lady trope. And these characters, and the characters that most embodied this, were important to me, even if they were arguably terrible too. A lot of the shows and films I'm going to talk about were some of my literal favourites when I was younger, and writing this video has almost felt like I've been dragging myself the entire time. I couldn't even write this piece without acknowledging that I probably wouldn't be the type of person I am, woman or artist, I am without some of these pieces of media, or some of the people in them. Representation is important, even when it's shit, apparently. So yeah, the 90s were particularly charged in regards to this trope being used in pretty successful Hollywood productions. The aforementioned Basic Instinct being released in 1992, as well as the Drew Barrymore starring Poison Ivy, and a little children's animation with big effect that I will talk about more later. There is 1998's Wild Things, which has one good thing about it, which is that you get to see Kevin Bacon's dick, which had the goal to come out the same year as the Gia adaptation, which I haven't watched in years but I remember kind of liking. American Beauty, Girl Interrupted and Cruel Intentions all came out in 1999. All of these films don't just use the concept of bisexuality and mental health issues, but basically attempt to write the bisexual black widow, and some do so more successfully than others. Like, sorry Cruel Intentions, no one thinks Catherine is the villain of your movie, she's the only one anyone likes. Silly rabbit. 
My triumph isn't over. It's over you. Come again? You are very much in love with her. And you're still in love with her. But it amused me to make you ashamed of it. You gave up on the first person you ever loved because I threatened your reputation. Don't you get it? You're just a toy, Sebastian. A little toy I like to play with. And now you've completely blown it with her. I think it's the saddest thing I've ever heard. Cheers. 21st Century Betrayals. The use of this trope on television these days seems to have adapted further, and if the 90s was full of this reckless, wild bisexual with a murderous streak, more modern portrayals tend to take the path of damaged. Where society has begun to change its ideals, if only mildly, on how we portray people with mental health issues on screen, so has said depiction, tying these new characters' sexual deviant behaviours to an origin of trauma rather than evil. Betrayals in the 90s would acknowledge the trauma in these women, but it was just always less sympathetic. The suicidal, traumatised bisexual who is promiscuous because she is sad, not manic, seems to be the vibe modern writers tend to go for now. There are still some pretty classical representations of this trope, like not Harley Quinn, Barbara Keane on Gotham, for example, although we'll come back to DC in a minute, but this trope has definitely adapted. A show that I think has had a pretty formidable impact on bisexual representation over the last half decade or so is Mr. Robot. LGBT representation as a whole has been influenced by Mr. Robot. But like the majority of the main characters in Mr. Robot are portrayed as bisexual, women and men alike. The characters of Darlene and Angela, the women leads of Mr. Robot, are both written to be bisexual, although I don't think the word is ever said. And both are, you know, nuts. Everyone in Mr. Robots is nuts, arguably, but also they are arguably all queer, so we just end up in a loop. The adventures of crazy messes Darlene and Dom are worthy of an entire queer analysis on their own, as are Tyrell and Elliot, who will both be showing up in a video later, where I discuss male bisexuality and the tropes used in that regard. So yeah, Mr. Robot is very queer, very bisexual, and we see this crazy bisexual representation of women at least three different times in Mr. Robot with Darlene and her unhealthy but still weirdly supportive relationship with Dom, and we see it with Shayla and Angela. Darlene consistently uses her body and her sexuality to gain access to women and men, and Angela does too, and almost all of this is tied back to their early years trauma. Like, Darlene isn't even shown to be explicitly bisexual until she is required to manipulate a specific woman and needs to get into her house. I mean, Darlene also looks and acts like this, so she has always definitely been portrayed as bisexual, but within the writing, her shadiness, her ability to do fucked up things because she is unwell and traumatised, is undeniably tied to her bisexuality. And I'm not going to spoil Mr. Robot because it's the kind of show you don't want to spoil, but let's just say that the show has a lot of bisexuality, but not a lot of respect for said bisexuality. I think Alison from Pretty Little Liars is a pretty good example of this too. Someone who is not just mentally ill and bisexual, but is a manipulative bisexual, using their mental health issues and trauma to fuel their own needs and goals. Brittany from Glee, too, a character that is definitely multifaceted enough to appear in multiple tropes videos, is definitely a surreal and off-centre, very Glee take on this trope, too. She is bisexual and promiscuous and, quote, not normal, and all of these things essentially connect to lay the foundations of her character and how her character achieves things. There are films like Black Swan, Chloe, The Favourite, or Lorna Morello from Orange is the New Black, or Jenny Schechter from that one terrible show we all watched as teenagers. Even characters like Fleabag. Definitely characters like Fleabag. Stay tuned for a future Phoebe Waller-Bridge bisexuality and BPD take one day. And sure, these characters are all relatable, at least it seems that way online, but they are morally questionable, always. And I think this is the kicker. This is how we can see the thread from Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct to Villanelle. We like Villanelle more. I like Villanelle more, and she is better written, no doubt. The malice isn't there the same, but she is still a shadow of the same character. And the difference this time, I guess, is that there are two crazy bisexuals in Killing Eve. I love Killing Eve, please don't throw hands. Harley Quinn, the Gotham City Sirens, and the DC Comics-shaped elephant in the room. 
Batman the Animated Series began in 1992. The Year Basic Instinct and Poison Ivy were also both released, and it kind of changed the course of Batman culture. At least, it definitely left a mark on some of Batman's villains more specifically, helping to shape the characterization of Joker, Poison Ivy, and other Gotham City rogues in a way that can still be seen in Batman media today. The show is also well known for the creation of one Dr. Harleen Quinzel, MD, who throughout the series and her later inceptions, perhaps becomes the most recognisable vessel on the planet for the classic crazy bisexual trope. And she is not the only one either. Like, the percentage of female characters in the DC universe that are queer is almost 100% when you consider every timeline in canon. But when it comes to this trope, DC is specifically good at creating sexually manipulative villains who use their bisexuality in unhinged ways to pursue a criminal lifestyle. Harley is bisexual. Ivy is bisexual. Selina is bisexual. That's literally three for three on the sirens. And no one in the DC universe has ever represented this trope better than Harley, though. Maybe no one in the actual universe. Whether that be in her original Paul and Bruce Inception, her mad love roller coaster with Joker and Ivy, or in literally any comic she has appeared in in the last 30 years, or in any of her further animations, or in the games, or in her live action appearances. No one does wild, manipulative, crazy bisexual like Harley fucking Quinn. And no character has consistently been able to translate this trope through so many damn mediums by so many separate writers. Her inconsistent and unpredictable character is her only consistency, it seems. She is sold as such in merchandise too. She is daddy's little monster. She's totally mad for you. To come back to what I said earlier about how trauma-ridden narratives are really common now, for a character tarnished with the brush of this particular trope, she is arguably my favourite character of all time, maybe bar one other. And even I can admit the use of this trope and the persistency in this trope is massively to do with how well Harley has been received and then marketed over the last three decades. Every angsty girl on TV these days is just kind of Harley Quinn. I mentioned it briefly in my Maeve Wiley is bisexual video. This may as well be called the Harley Quinn effect. Riverdale at least had the balls to just go there. And well, now that I have simply acknowledged Harley's existence, let me put her aside for a moment. I'm sure everyone's favorite clown will make a reappearance eventually. Okay, so this trope exists and we can acknowledge and address it, but what's the damage anyhow? What are the effects of this trope, if any? How is this trope influenced by real life? And how does this trope, in turn, affect real life bisexual women? Why are we even here? Well, as all intersections of the LGBT spectrum, umbrella, community, whatever word you choose to use, bisexual people have bad mental health. Bisexual people suffer from bad mental health sometimes because of societal and cultural influences and expectations. Bisexual plus people, including those who are queer identifying or pan identifying, especially bisexual women and also bisexual trans men, have the highest rates of mental health issues amongst LGBT people. For example, the University of Manchester found that bisexual people were over six times more likely to self-harm than their heterosexual peers, and two to four times more likely than their lesbian and gay peers. The British Journal of Psychiatry found that bisexuals have higher rates of almost all mental health issues, bisexual women have twice the likelihood of suffering from serious eating disorders than lesbian women. One particular human rights survey found that 61% of bisexual women and 37% of bisexual men had been raped. A study at the University of North Dakota found that bisexual people and lesbians were more likely to present DSM categorised symptoms of personality disorders, but that, and I quote, this disparity was especially pronounced in bisexual women who had significantly greater prevalence rates than heterosexual women in 7 out of 10 diagnostic categories. And whilst it's easy to brush this all off with, well, bisexual women are statistically crazy, so why would these portrayals be read as anything but truth? That would be incorrect. Bisexual women are not born broken. I know it's like a fun narrative, one a lot of bisexual women can play into sometimes aesthetically, because it's safe in some weird way. But we aren't. God, you're so smug. Harley, you didn't change me. You helped me, sure, you know, but I didn't always hate people. It wasn't until Mr. Ferris died. Mr. Ferris? You mean Joker's Ferris? No, I mean Mr. Ferris the ficus. He was my first plan. The first time my father hit me, that's when I gave up on humans. Until I met you. You never told me I... I'm sorry. Yeah, it was a long time ago. 
There is no definitive biological proof of what causes mental health issues, and mental health issues cannot be grouped together as one concept. The mistreatment of bisexual people, bisexual women, in their real day-to-day -day lives because of the passing ideas that travel through society is the take here. The relationship between audience and creator is not a one-way street. It is a cycle. Writers are usually humans who learn the ideas that they put forward in their work from somewhere, from society, from the things they watch and read and see, from the people and communities that have raised them. Bisexual women are statistically more likely to suffer from mental health issues because they are discriminated against, because they are usually poorer or in the closet, or because they are more likely to be abused, because they are more likely to be single parents. Until stories become about the examination of this fact when centering crazy bisexual women, then this trope is just kind of useless. It is why Harley Quinn, I think, is loved so much by both those that misrepresent and misunderstand her character as much as the women and girls she is essentially based on. There is a twisted truth to the reality she represents. Bisexual women are more likely to be mentally ill, yeah, because people treat us like garbage. And for all the failures in the depictions of Harley Quinn over the years, there was at least an attempt by her original creators to kind of address this when they created her. Like, I really kind of hate her origin story. It's pretty yikes. But it never really shies away from the fact that the Joker is the villain here, and Harley the victim. Harley isn't Catherine Trammell, Lady Lecter, a rampant and almost unimaginable male fantasy. As all millennial women, I am true crime obsessed, and this whole Ed Kemper mindhunter thing just doesn't happen with women serial killers. Harley is different. She is damaged. But, like, diagnosably so. And I want to say this is better, but I'm not sure it is. Like, most people these days can acknowledge basic instinct for the buffoonery it is. Harley and Fleabag and Alison, they all feel different in my opinion. Personal feels about personality disorders. So this video has pretty much descended into a confessional at this point, so I guess I'll just throw this out there and hope for the best. Most of these characters that I've talked about are written as if they have borderline personality disorder almost always never diagnosed. Sometimes a different personality disorder will rear its head in this trope. Writers seem to like bipolar too for these women, and sometimes we'll even get the odd diagnosis. However, like I said, most of these characters are written as having BPD, and I know this because I have BPD. Yay for me. Borderline personality disorder is a personality disorder that affects mood, and therefore behaviour because of said mood. This disorder specifically has a large influence on how people with BPD perceive themselves and other people and the emotions involved with maintaining these relationships. The quickest and possibly least medically appropriate description I can give you for this disorder is that most people with BPD think that you hate them. We cry or get internally angry a lot and we feel every single feeling at max capacity and we feel everything all of the time. In my home country, the diagnosis has recently been renamed to emotionally unstable personality disorder. Because apparently that's supposed to sound better. Um, it doesn't. But that should give you a clue into the kind of symptoms we sometimes have to deal with. Look, even if you don't get it, it's still pretty cool to be nominated, right? Right? Uh, no, I would do a header out that window and let my brains smash all over the sidewalk. Ah, <laughs> you're joking. It is not a scary or violent disorder, quite the opposite and is diagnosed more frequently in women and LGBT people. Which, I'm not going to go into all of the ethics of that right now. According to the UK's National Health Service, the symptoms of BPD can essentially be organised into four categories, as I will let Harley Quinn demonstrate. Again, not a medical professional, just trying to use a metaphor. These symptoms are Emotional instability, the psychological term for this being affective dysregulation, this is about the inability to control one's emotions or emotional responses. Jesus, Harles! This is why I don't put the good TV out. Oh, shit, how we exploded! No! Oh. no, no. Joker, you That's my son of a bitch. Disturbed patterns of thinking or perception. Cognitive distortions or perceptual distortions, also known as, wait for it, black and white thinking. Or sometimes splitting. This can also affect how someone with BPD sees themselves.
Mom. Don't put your insecurities on me. Uh, all right, here we go. What? What? You tell me what insecurities? Uh, you just don't want me to join because you're afraid I won't need you anymore. You are delusional. Am I? Am I? You loved it when I was all beaten down and brokenhearted after breaking up with Joker. But you hate it now that I'm better at making something of myself. Ooh, snap. Damn! That's not true. It's true. You can't handle it, can ya? What? You're trying to sabotage me instead of confronting the fact that without me, you don't have a single friend in this world. Uh, I don't need this shit. Like I've always said, I'm not part of your crew, so... Oh, great, go! Run away to your stupid plants! You know they have names! What the hell are you looking at?! Impulsive behavior usually is a way of dealing with overwhelming and unbearable emotions. Yeah. It's on me. Hey, shit! Two shots. Drinks! <laughs> hey. your help. I got this. You got this? You sure about that? Yeah, no wonder everyone hates me. Intense but unstable relationships with other people. I finally see that slime for what he is. A murderous, manipulative, irredeemable, And yeah, my problem with this is, people do actually have this disorder in real life. It isn't fun, and we get treated badly. Like, people with BPD are quite often rejected from actual therapists because even they don't want to deal with us. So either I have to accept that my illness is fine as long as it's unlabeled, sexy, and marketable, or I have to face the fact that people in my life will expect Harley Quinn and all the aesthetic wonder and bravado she has instead of the crying, socially suppressed, non-functioning weirdo that I am. It just leaves a funny taste in my mouth that the symptoms of these disorders are explored more than the causes or the treatments. None of the social mistreatment is ever focused on in any other capacity than a joke with most of these characters. Harley is cool and she's sexy, though she is also seriously ill. And the ball is more often dropped than not when it comes to depict the more traumatic, unpleasant sides of serious mental health issues, especially with bisexual plus women. Like, putting Harley aside for a moment, and again, I will probably at some point make a Phoebe Waller-Bridge video separately discussing all of this, but Fleabag, as I mentioned, is a pretty damning example of this too, in my opinion. All the symptoms are there. We get to laugh at Fleabag for being reckless and pushing everyone away because she loves too much, feels too hard, but when she finally has a moment to sit down in front of a counsellor and discuss these issues, Phoebe Waller-Bridge decides to make a joke instead. A Killing Eve reference for the gays. Joy. And it always is kind of a joke. Until it's not. And someone ends up dead. As well as the harm done to us by others, women with personality disorders, women who are bisexual have incredibly high rates of self-harm and suicide. Higher rates than literally any other kind of woman. This trope never focuses on the ugly enough, and rarely offers the kind of closure expired for these types of stories. This trope is wholly transparent when it comes to its tendency to continue the hypersexualization and villainization of bisexual women with personality disorders. I mean, researchers at Harvard Med found that people with borderline personality disorder are statistically likely to be queer, especially bisexual. And of course, some representations are going to be better than others. Not everyone I have mentioned is Catherine Trammell or even Harley Quinn levels of extreme presentation of this trope, but they are all still shadows of this archetype. I mean, I can pick some of the most famous, wealthy, rich bisexual women on the planet, people like Drew Barrymore and Angelina Jolie, like I mentioned, or Amber Heard and Megan Fox, and they have all suffered the real-life media cycle version of this exact depiction, this exact crazy bisexual chick trope. So like, imagine what it's like to not be rich enough to ignore this stuff. Maria San Filippo has a great section in her book, The B Word, titled Jolie, Bisexual Butch Femme. And I'm going to end this video with her words instead of mine, because they summarise a lot of how I feel on this via Angelina Jolie. Her words are more focused, and honestly I think they're kind of beautiful. Passivity attributed to Pitt during this drawn-out media episode significantly coloured and then overshadowed her other publicly reported activities at the time, adopting orphan children and working as a UNICEF ambassador. 
Her early career persona is a bisexual wild woman who enjoyed blade play and sported multiple tattoos has been tempered by these more staid recent interests in mothering, philanthropy, and most recently writing and directing her first film. Yet, the public's perception of her as a sexually unrestrained adventuress, one that she courted in early interviews, then endured during the Aniston Pitt episode, has changed its tone distinctively. A crucial point came during her onstage admission to being in love with brother James Haven at the 2000 Academy Awards presentation, which prompted rumours of an incestuous relationship and shifted the tide of opinion toward its current estimation of Angelina the Perverse rather than Angelina the Adventurous. I've been Mage, and this has been Black and White Thinking.